Today is the uh, lecture class for the sound chapter of CI O level. We just saw a small video from a uh, YouTube channel. The video link will be shared within the video description of this uh, lecture. Uh, it's, it's recommended that anyone who is uh, undergoing this uh, or video should see that video first and then uh, can start seeing this part. We're gonna cover the remaining parts which was not, not discussed within that lecture and we're gonna also see some problem solving, relevant problem solving as well. So primarily the formula which were totally opted out uh, within that video uh, is first of all V equals to F lambda. We know this, form this formula uh, is uh, exactly applicable for all sorts of waves like whether it's a mechanical wave, electromagnetic wave, longitudinal wave or transverse wave, whatever type. V equals to F lambda is the is a factor that is applicable for all waves whatsoever. What is interesting for you to understand that if frequency of a certain wave is dependent on source, whereas speed of a certain wave is dependent on medium. These are the two factors which control the presence of these two variables and lambda is always the outcome of how these two variables are controlled. So basically lambda is the, you can say sort of like the resultant uh, uh, quantity uh, which we can get uh, by this equation. So lambda is <coughs> automatically defined by the ratio of those two quantities. So the reason I'm trying to tell you this is that if we try to make different frequency sounds using different uh, frequency equipments, maybe tuning fork, maybe human voice, maybe uh, musical instruments and whatsoever. But if we make all of those sounds within atmospheric air at a fixed temperature and fixed humidity, because these two factors, uh, temperature and humidity also affects the speed of sound in air. So let's say we have the RTP, room temperature and pressure at standard humidity. So if we use different frequency instrument, then individual sources, depending upon their own vibration rate, uh, depending upon their own frequency, they will produce different frequency sound. But all of those sounds, which are gonna be pro propagated through the same air medium to reach up to our ear, they would all have the same speed. So if some sound is produced at a higher frequency, we're gonna hear it at a lower amplitude because for that case, V would be a constant. So if you choose your medium to be fixed and if you use different sources to produce different frequency of sounds, your speed of the wave would be remain, it would be constant within that medium, but different frequency would dictate how the wavelength would behave. So that's one way to put that, that is if we keep the medium constant. On the other hand, on the other side, uh, or on the other version, the other version of this uh, consideration is that if we use one single frequency, let's say we're gonna observe that how does one single frequency source behave in different medium. For example, let's say we pick up one of the uh, tuning force that makes maybe 1000 Hertz of sound. We can put that medium into multiple different, we can put, we can take the tuning fork, which is a single source of a perfectly sinusoidal wave. And let's say we're gonna put that sound source in multiple different medium. We can choose air, we can choose water, we can choose soybean oil, we can choose kerosene, we can choose a bit of a glycerin maybe, we can choose glass, we can choose um, wood. You can put that vibration into multiple different medium. And whenever we are gonna change, change the medium, the frequency of the sound that is produced from a 1000 Hertz uh, tuning fork, all of those medium, within all of those medium, that sound will have the exact same frequency of 1000 Hertz, because that is def defined by the property of the source. However, in different medium, we're gonna have different speed of that wave. And depending upon that, the lambda would be defined. So faster medium will necessarily give you a bigger wavelength, because if you just, just have a look over here, V equals to F lambda. So if I take the F to be a constant, same frequency being played on different medium, we simply can take out this uh, constant out of this equation and we are gonna get V proportional to lambda. It means faster mediums would give us long, bigger wavelength and vice versa and so on and so forth. So this is the basic idea how the sound, uh, sound would be affected uh, for this equation. Just this much information is good for you if you remember this much that speed is controlled by the medium choice and frequency is controlled by the source that we choose. One more thing that is important that uh, like all other waves, sound waves also undergo physical incidence of reflection and refraction and also it undergoes diffraction as well. Now what these things are, I'm gonna go by one by one. 
the idea of reflection is very simple. The idea of reflection is that whenever a certain wave goes towards a solid boundary, uh, it reflects off that boundary, maintaining incident angle equals to reflection angle. The experiment that can prove us to show that sound actually undergoes reflection requires a bit of experimental setup. The reason we need a bit of an experimental setup because sound is such a uh, such a wave that whenever we produce it from any source, it always tends to spread out in a spherical direction. For example, if you're sitting in your place, you just make a loud sound. It would pretty much be uh, audible from all parts of that room. Or maybe you're aiming towards the monitor, or maybe you're aiming towards your mobile device, uh, pad or whatever. Uh, but that sound is audible from everywhere, which means basically the vibration that is going to come out of your mouth is using your vocal cord that is going to spread in all direction. This spreading out of energy actually reduces the uh, concentration of the sound, or in other words, you can say that's the amplitude property, uh, which leads to the loudness of a sound. So uh, how loud a sound should hear is highly dependent upon uh, how much amplitude does the air molecules vibrate by. So uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the property of sound. There are three key properties of sound, pitch, uh, loudness, and quality after a while. But what I need to understand that because sound energy, whenever we normally make sound within air, air medium, the sound spreads out. Because of the spreading out, the energy content of that sound actually diminishes very fast. So, which means that if you, let's say I'm trying to make, uh, let's say, uh, I'm trying, let's say I'm, I'm making a sound, let's say ah, I'm making that sound. Hypothetically, let's say assume that within every compression, within every compression, let's say I'm putting 10 joule of energy. Now, when this compression is close to my mouth, 10 joule of energy is, is concentrated within that small circle of compression. As the sound spreads out, that circle of compression, which was shown as the wavefront in the earlier video, as that spreads out, that same 10 joule of energy would be contained within that circle. So as the circle gets bigger, the energy concentration becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. This is why uh, somewhere uh, far out, we, uh, people cannot hear me. If I want other people to hear me from far out, I need to use a louder voice. I have to shout. In some cases, I have to use a loudspeaker. Or if even that doesn't work, we might use a cone conical object uh, through which we can speak and we can actually focus our sound energy to go in a specific direction other than spinning out in all direction. This is why the experiment that by which we can prove that sound actually undergoes reflection requires a bit of a setup. So let me just show you one of those setup uh, how this might look like. Sir, AJ, I'm Rajay, আমাদের যে আওয়াজটা করি ওইটার চেয়ে কোনের আওয়াজটা বেশি কোন দি আওয়াজ করলে তাহলে এটা কিসের জন্য না इट्स नथिंग लाइक दैट आई विल टेल यू व्हाट আমাদের আওয়াজের থেকে কোনের আওয়াজ টিপিক্যালি বেশি হয় না মানে ইফ ইউ আর নট ইউজিং ইফ ইউ আর ইউজিং এ বেসিক কনিকাল শেপ অবজেক্ট উইথ নো ইলেক্ট্রোম্যাগনেটিক ডিভাইস এমপ্লিফাইং आवर সাউন্ড আই মিন ইউ আর নট ইউজিং আ মাইক ইফ ইউ ইউজ আ মাইক কাইন্ড অফ ডিভাইস আই মিন ফর एग्जांपल লেট মি জাস্ট শো ইউ Yeah, there are certain devices which look like this. These devices actually have a rechargeable battery within or maybe a normal uh, dry cell battery. You can talk through this part. This, there are multiple microphones for it, which is going to pick up the sound. Using the energy of the battery, this is going to amplify the sound and shoot forward. This, is, this amplifies the sound. This can make actually louder sound compared to the actual voice. But what I am trying to talk about is a handheld... Uh, No, no, no. I'm trying to talk about just a conical object which can actually stop the spreading of the sound. I don't see any such thing object. It's very much simple. I mean, let's say you have this whole thing except for the electronics and the central cone. You, are, you just have this conical shape of object and you are talking to the behind of it. That will allow the energy not to spread out and rather be focused in a straight forward direction. That thing, I, I can see the any image for that. Maybe people don't use it anymore because these things are so much available right now. For example, for, for example, for example, Chanachur Walara, Majhama Jai use Kore Chanachur Exactly, I'm talking about exactly that thing. Okay, so reflection of sound apparatus set up to host is more or less Erocom. So this is actually a pretty nice figure. Uh, this figure is bigger. What is the definition? What is the definition? 
Okay, this figure is a slightly bigger or maybe this one. Yeah, let's, uh, let's pick this image. <coughs> so the way this uh, experiment actually works out is that this is the top view of the experiment. What we are doing is that, so let's say this is uh, the screen that we're seeing, let's say this is the top, this is the top surface of a table. On front of a table, we're gonna use a vertical slab, which is labeled over here as a board, which should be hard enough to give us enough reflection. And we're gonna use two hollow pipes. They can be normal PVC pipes, which is used for plumbing in buildings. And we will, we, we will place these two pipes facing towards the board at a fixed point with equal angle. That's the part that we, there's a geometrical construction that we have to uh, draw on the table uh, earlier, or maybe we can use a large piece of paper and drop this to angle, place the board properly with enough support. Uh, the stands and clamps are not shown over here for the sake of simplicity, but these two pipes are aiming in the same direction. And the way this experiment can work is that if we just uh, do something like this, uh, let's say there was this another image uh where is that uh Asha, yeah any of these things actually could work the, so what is happening we're going to place the stopwatch over here so this is actually a mechanical stopwatch which are not the digital one digital watches don't make any sound or you can use the alarm clock, but alarm clock would be audible on the other side. So if you use a mechanical stopwatch or just a regular clock that makes that click, 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 click sound for every second mark. So we're gonna place all these watches over here and we're gonna try to hear that sound through the tube on the other end. What we'll find out if these two tubes are perfectly aligned with equal angle, we are able, we'll be able to hear the sound of this watch from this distance. Otherwise, if we, re, if we take away these tubes, the sound directly traveling from here all the way to this here over here would not be audible. No one can actually hear that sound. But once we allow the tubes, the sound is not allowed to actually spread out. The sound is gonna reflect off the inside wall of these tubes and come out as a beam of sound. And whenever they're gonna be reflected off this board, they're gonna undergo some amount of spread. But once again, most of the sound is gonna be reflected towards at the same angle. So the waves are gonna be reflected off by the same angle and they're gonna enter within the tube. And once they enter this reflection tube or on the right side tube, once again, the sounds are gonna get reflected within the, within the inner wall of the tube and eventually reach to the ear. This allows to prove that sound actually undergoes reflection. And what's also interesting, if we use non-equal angles for the alignment of the studios, for example, let's say over here, we give an angle of 40 degree, but over here we give an angle of, let's say, 45 degrees, somewhat significantly different, then we would not be able to hear the uh, hear the uh, uh, reflection as well. The reason I'm choosing to give a much bigger angle because the path of the sound that we are choosing to flow by is actually quite large. We're using a th uh, pretty large PVC pipe for the sound to travel by. So a little bit of difference of like maybe one or two degree, we would still be able to hear the sound, no big deal. But once we make the angle significantly different, then uh, the sound wouldn't be uh, captured and we wouldn't be able to hear that. So this actually proves that sound undergoes reflection. So that's the behavior, uh, that's the experiment for that. And then sound also undergoes refraction. For those who remember from our earlier classes or through your uh, school lectures, refraction is the property of, of a wave where whenever any wave goes from one medium to another medium, because of the difference of speed of the wave in the two mediums, the wave changes direction at the uh, transition surface. Transition surface. Transition, surface. transition surface means the surface at which one medium finishes, the other medium starts. This uh, incident of changing direction uh, is what we call refraction. Now, the refraction of sound experiment is actually quite difficult to show in a laboratory environment. I'm not sure the syllabus is bad. This is a good thing. I'm not sure if I'm not sure if I'm not sure But other than actually, I'm uh, uh, going to look into the syllabus. I'm going to show the experiment very fast. It's a pretty simple experiment. The experiment looks somewhat like this.
this is actually a pretty uh, realistic example for how the reflection of sound can actually occur in an in a practical life case this is one of the uh, experiment that we can wh where we can use uh, carbon dioxide for the case of refraction so the way this thing works is that carbon dioxide is a medium that is denser compared to air carbon dioxide sinks in air so if we have a speaker somewhere over here on the left and we place and if we if we do not place a carbon dioxide balloon just place a microphone over here we're going to receive one specific amount of sound over here. Let's say we're gonna put this microphone uh, into onto an, uh, through an oscilloscope. Do you guys know what an oscilloscope is? Did I ever talk to you about oscilloscopes? No, sir. Achha. Oscilloscope is the electronic device that allows us to visualize a certain wave. Actually, oscilloscope can be used for a lot of different purposes, like a lot of different purposes. But one of the ways, I mean, let me just put it this way. In many cases, we represent sound waves look like this, right? Sound waves look like this. How did we, how on earth did we ever come to know that sound waves look like this? If, if you need to understand that I did not label any of the axes. Typically, the axes can look like that. Here we have pressure, here we have time. This is the pressure wave that the video, uh, earlier video just showed us. Or if we try to represent the uh, displacement of a single particle with respect to time, that can be also shown like this, that we have a sinusoidal motion. These kind of curves were initially generated using an oscilloscope. So an oscilloscope actually can give us a graphical representation of an electrical input. So uh, um, uh, we have the whole construction and uh, how the how it oscilloscope work within our syllabus. We're going to see about that in the, within the electronics part of the syllabus. I'm just normally at a finish bully. Shadow che oscilloscope ammonite device. The device and mode am at a certain point at a voltage input devo. We're going to input a certain input voltage within the device. And that device can give us uh, within, a, within the display that device can give us a plotting with respect to time. How does this input voltage changes with respect to time? That's all the all that an oscilloscope does. So if we if this input voltage is constant, then this on the on the screen we're gonna get a flat line. If this voltage is undergoing some change, we're gonna get some variation. If this voltage is a sinusoidal curve, we're gonna get a sine curve. If it's a uh, if it's not a sine curve, if it's a something else, for example, human voice or other equipments with quality, we might as well get some variation like that. So we're going to see how the voltage changes, which is to, uh, which is to time. The way we convert the sound energy into electrical voltage is microphone. So microphone is basically the device which can capture the sound energy out of the air molecules wherever we place it. And we, it can convert that sound energy into voltage or electrical signal. And then we can feed it into the into an oscilloscope and eventually see how does that sound work. So the way this experiment can work that we have the microphone over here we can feed it to an oscilloscope and actually see how much loud sound do we have 
Now, if we don't use a balloon, we're going to have a certain loudness. But whenever we are going to place the carbon dioxide balloon over here, that loudness is going to increase. The reason is very simple. The shape of this carbon dioxide balloon is uh, sort of like a convex lens. And the density of this medium is more than the air. So whenever the outward wave actually enters within this medium, pretty much like the way a convex lens or a, or a converging lens works, these waves are concentrated and eventually fed back into the microphone, which was shown in one of these figures, uh, which I uh, picked a bit earlier. Where is that? Sir, ekta chowi party chowi the dekhte varen. Ha? Ekta chowi party chowi the ki kabe na ki dekhen. Acha ek minute darao. Ekta ek ek ekta figure the dekhlam jodi kotha dekhsilam. Ah, just a second. Aj aj. So this is one of those. Uh, this is actually a simple experimental representation that. Uh, this can be done. What they have over here, this is actually a soap balloon inside which we trapped some carbon dioxide. This experiment is difficult to perform with uh, earlier equipment setups, but if we could manage this thing, what was observed that if we have a, a clicking or ticking clock over here, that sound could be heard from here at a much louder range because as the sound spreads out, this thing sort of works like a convex lens for sound wave and eventually can bend the waves inwards. So for carbon dioxide, we can have the converging effect. If we use helium, it, it does the exit opposite thing. It actually spreads out the wave even more. So that actually makes the sound uh, travel less. And another practical example. So let's have a look uh, on the messenger. Yeah, exactly. So this is also one of the examples for how the refraction of sound can actually work. I'll, 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 I'll explain what is happening over here. Yeah, uh, uh, Nohan, thank you very much. This is actually uh, the yeah. thing that I was looking for, which is also explained with a with the presence of a water body right over here. I, I, I came across this figure, then I went forward. Where is that water body figure? Refraction of sound. Let's close this. Uh, not diffraction. Uh, okay. So <clears throat> this is actually one of those figures where we can actually uh, represent for a natural phenomenon, the reflection of sound can be actually be used. Let me explain what is happening over here. So what this figure actually goes on to show us, if the air has a certain temperature variation on a certain part of the 24 hours that the lower level of water uh, air temperature is cool and the upper temperature is warm. If you wonder how could that possibly happen, this can happen for a certain geographical processes. Uh, typically, the way atmosphere behaves is that the temperature close to our surface is usually always warm and temperature away from our surface is usually uh, cold. So this is a sort of a bit of a uh, reverse scenario. So this scenario is mostly available uh, when the sun has set and the temperature of the land is cooling down faster than the temperature of the body of the water. So, I mean, the, if we have a situation like this, that, that, that is we have cold air over here, we have warm air over here, the speed of sound within high temperature is more and the speed of sound within cool temperature, uh, cool temperature air is less temperature affects the speed of sound is with a positive a positive uh, reinforcement, which means uh, the higher the temperature of atmosphere, the more, uh, the faster the sound can travel through that medium. Because simply the air particles can move faster with high temperature because the boundary motion is more, uh, more, uh, more, uh, more rapid. So 
faster moving particles essentially can transfer the vibration from one particle to another particle much too easily as well. So whenever we have a situation like this, it's possible that if we make a single sound over here or maybe a continuous sound over a continuous sound will actually detect or difficult. Let's say there is a person who is right over here. Let's say here is a ear. Uh, ear. I am giving a dot and showing. Let's say here is a ear, a person's ear. We made a single sound over. Here. Let's say we uh, made a firecracker go off. So what's going to happen? This sound is going to travel in a path like this, and this sound is also going to travel in a path like this. But although this path is significantly longer in curve. But the speed of sound over here is going to be much faster and the speed of sound over here is going to be much slower. Now, depending upon the variation of temperature, it is possible this person is going to be hearing two different sounds coming from the same source. So he might as well hear is what we call usually call like an echo, although there is no reflection surface over here. The reason he might be able to hear two different sounds is that one sound might travel through here to towards this person through the faster medium in a curve path earlier. Whereas the horizontal sound is going to travel to him much slowly and eventually reach him later. So he is more likely to hear the warm temperatures carried sound earlier and the low temperature carried sound might be heard later. This is more commonly uh, applicable for actually uh, trains. The, uh, the, the, the figure actually uh, Nuhan sent us is that if we, have a, uh, if we have a situation like this, that a train is going through some tunnel, and it is making a large sound. People who are on the further side, they would be able to hear this sound even for a very large distance because the sound can actually curve through the atmosphere and eventually reach up to this person. Uh, what the point that I'm trying to mean over here is that for my example over here, I'm assuming that this entire path in between the source and the ear is blank. There is no obstruction over here. And this path is also unobstructed. So in that case, the ear would be able to hear two different sounds. But if it so happened that we had some hills and some trees and some people over here and, and this path is obstructed, then it is possible that this person would be able to hear this sound through the curved path to the atmosphere as well. In this case, this, this part, if this uh, straight line path is obstructed somehow for physical hindrance or structures, the person would be able to hear this sound through the curved path of the atmosphere later on. It means this would allow the person to hear a really far away sound even clearly. This is why, uh, this is why sounds made at night usually are much usually usually are usually heard even from a pretty far away distance, and that's what makes the nocturnal animals capable to feed off of, of their food when it's even night because uh, there is no light, so they actually depend upon sound and. Even though there is no light, because of this curved curve behavior of sound, they can actually have a huge range of area. For example, owls and bats, they use that. Owls still use uh, optics, uh, optics a lot, but they also use uh, audible uh, sensors a lot as well. Uh, so this is actually the example for refraction of sound, which can prove to be pretty useful and uh, interesting. Make sense? Any questions so far, anyone? No, sir. The third sir, I have a question. Yeah, bolo, bolo, bolo. Sir, the only difference between these two taken by the sound is the time taken. Yes. Okay. Because, uh, well, they have the time variation because they have a speed variation. And because they have a speed variation, they will by default have a lambda variation. Get this part. What the person who is hearing the sound, if the person actually hears both of the sound, what the person will perceive for these two sound, he is not going to experience uh, the speed variation or the lambda variation. But he is going to hear the same frequency of sound because, like I said, frequency of the sound is dependent on the source. So the same frequency was produced over here. So he's going to hear the same frequency sound in the same pattern. But he's going to hear those two sounds at two different time instances. So for the observable, uh, what property can the per person observe? That is the time variation. But obviously you should understand this is a faster medium. So it means V is big over here, V is small over here. If v is big, that means bigger lambda. V is small, that means lambda is smaller. So those variables would also be different for the 
passing process. Yes, I got it. Beautiful. Awesome. Ita galo. The next thing that we have is that diffraction of sound. Let me just uh, elaborate what uh, what the idea of diffraction is. Diffraction is defined as the bending of waves. Try to get this word. Diffraction is defined as the bending of waves as it travels through a gap or goes around a, around a border. I'll say it again. I'll show you some examples. Diffraction is defined as the bending of waves as it goes through a gap or it travels around a border. For example, one of the simple example uh, for diffraction of waves, let me just show you some image. Google is so helpful. I mean, I don't have to draw almost, physically draw almost anything. Uh, yes, this is actually a really nice figure. Have all the variations that we need. And we might as well also pick up the other variations a little bit later. So we have, uh, we can see the comparison. This is nice. Yes. So be small. Yes. Awesome. This is actually a really nice image. So let's have a look at this image and try to get different parts of it. So diffusion wave. Diffusion is a phenomenon which waves spread out as they pass through an aperture or an obstacle. Aperture means gap. Aperture is just another synonym for the word gap. So, uh, no, sorry, my bad. Aperture pass through an aperture or an obstacle. Aperture means gap. In this case, aperture is shown as a small barrier. Am I not correct? Just a second. An opening, hole or gap, yes. So this is not actually an aperture. This is something else. I'm gonna talk about this afterwards, but this is the most common figure that we come across whenever uh, we're trying to describe uh, diffraction. The first part that you need to see clearly is that whenever the waves are going through a certain gap, you see the waves are not coming out as flat parts for which they are passing through, which means what I'm trying to mean is that we are not going to have the waves coming up just by this much with equal wavelength like that. Rather, the energy that is allowed to pass through this gap, I mean, all the energy which is actually falling onto these solid barriers, they would be absorbed by these barriers. But the energy amount that is actually allowed to pass through this gap, that's gonna start to spread out. That this behavior of spreading out is what you call diffraction. What is really interesting for you to see that there is a certain bit of angular space which where the waves are not reaching out. Do you see that? This amount of angular space is the, where the wave is not reaching out. This is because the wave spreads out, but it usually does not spread out all the way at a perfect 180 degree angle. It doesn't make perfect hemispheres. It almost never does. It spreads out a lot, but not. it doesn't actually go around to go over there. And uh, the how does this wave actually can make, uh, how does, how does this, uh, this amount of spreading, amount of spreading means what is the total amount of angle that this total spread actually does? Uh, let's say, what is this theta? The amount of spreading of the of a wave is dependent upon the comparison of two factors. One is the lambda, the other one is the gap size, let's say D. So you know what lambda is. In this case, D means gap size. So if we have the lambda and gap size equal, then we're gonna have a really nice scenario of uh, spreading. For example, what we have over here, factors affecting the magnitude of diffraction. So the first thing is wavelength. So what this figure is showing us that for both of these figures, we have the same size of gap. Have a look, this much gap and this much gap, they are the same size of gap. Whenever we have longer wavelength, longer wavelength essentially in this case mean that the wavelengths are nearly equal to the gap size. So 
if the wavelength is almost equal to gap size, I mean, I'm using approximate because they don't have to be exactly equal. Exactly equal would be the best case scenario. But if they are almost close, let's say one is six, the other one is 6.5, works, no big deal. But if one is two, the other one is four, doesn't work. So uh, if the lambda and the gap size are almost equal, nearly equal, then you're gonna have a, have a really large amount of spread. Whereas if the wavelength is small, then the spread would be less. You can have a look at the comparison of the spreading amount. This is the key, key part that you have to understand for the diffusion figure. And then again, uh, if we have the gap size smaller, for example, what you can see over here, we are using small wavelength waves for both of these examples. So this is the pair, this, 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 this table or this box is covering that if we have the same gap, but different wavelength, how what's gonna happen? So when the wavelengths are pretty much equal to the uh, gap size, we're gonna have really good spreading. If the wavelength is smaller than the gap size, then we're gonna have less spreading. Alternately, and now you might wonder what happens if this gets bigger? I'm getting to this just after that. If the wave fronts are, if, if the wavelength is almost equal to the gap. So you can see over here, small, small slit and small wavelength. So we have more diffraction. So this is actually almost also the case where the wavelength and the uh, gap size are nearly equal. But if the gap size is significantly big, where the lambda is significantly smaller than the gap size, we're gonna have less diffraction where part of the flat waves are coming up. So I mean, I, I would like to zoom in onto this figure a little bit to give a bit of a close view for this thing. Have a look. What you should see that as this wave is coming out, this is gonna spread out well and good, but this part is flat. Take a look. And then this part is flat as well. And this part is flat as well. So the way it usually works, uh, let me just choose a smaller thickness of pencil maybe. A significant portion of the wave comes out as flat, which is nearly the size of the opening. So, either opening size jotoduko hoy. Actually, this I, I actually put the lines in a wrong place. My bad. Whenever the gap size is significantly bigger than the lambda, flat wave come out through these parts. So, these waves are gonna be nearly flat nearly flat and curves are gonna happen on the sides like that. So that's what happens whenever we have a large slit and smaller wavelength. This is what we mean by the uh, by the idea of diffraction. So diffraction is a basic details question asana, but sometimes they set up questions like this. The other type of scenario that we need to consider for diffraction figures is what we had a uh, figure like this, for example, over here. Uh, this is a good one. So what you can see over here, if we have a small gap uh, that is nearly equal to the wavelength side, then we, that we have good spreading. If we have a large gap, we have less spreading. If we have a barrier that is just a barrier and we have waves passing on both sides. So you can see that the flat waves are going straight, flat waves are going straight, but from the corner of this barrier, waves are taking a little bit of a curve. And eventually, even, eventually this, these curves are gonna eventually match together. So we will not be able to see, for example, something like this, this is actually, pretty nice figure showing that the waves are gonna curve from the border as well. So this one, for example, yeah. So this is the behavior for, uh, what do you mean by diffraction? Sound waves also undergo diffraction. What is the most common way to prove that sound waves also undergo this kind of diffraction? Can you think of a certain experiment by which you can show you that sound actually undergoes diffraction? Can you think of an experiment? Like a basic regular experiment. The idea is that if you have a opening, the sound should be able to bend through it to go to places where you cannot see straight. This is a very simple example. Let's say this is a room. Uh, we, have a, we have one door. What we're gonna do we're gonna place a person over here. Let's say this is person one. And we're gonna place another person over here. This is person two.
and let's uh, yeah so the idea is that so let's say we're not going to place the person one over here rather uh, let me rub this i'm going to tell you why i rubbed it off i'm going to tell you uh, after a while let's say person one is over here this is our this is the head of the person one and this is person two this is a room and this is a door the door is open so you're looking from the top view so you're looking through the roof of that room's orientation all of these sides are the walls the idea is that this person is not in a straight line with person one and person two are not in a straight line uh, because there is a physical barrier the whole, through which the sound cannot pass through but there is a door open in between and so if the person one now starts making some sound with loud enough volume person two will be able to hear them which proves that as the sound comes out of through the door the sound actually starts to spread out by which the sound actually reaches to this person this is very simple proof that sound undergoes diffraction uh, this is this is applicable so in this case i'm using two persons now if you want to have physical proof for example people could lie you never know so if you want to have physical proof uh, with instruments it's also very simple you can place a loudspeaker over here which is being operated by a electrical source which is making a continuous sound maybe music maybe a single frequency whatever uh, and then you can place over here a microphone which is going to be connected with an oscilloscope once again important inform, important of important part for the experiment to be uh, logically acceptable is that the straight line path should be obstructed by the wall and there shouldn't be any way by which reflection should be reaching up over here for example i place the microphone over here the possibility for sound to get reflected off this wall and which reach up to this person is actually quite low because i'm making the sound like that in the forward direction so this can actually happen and this is also the reason why i did not prefer my person one over here because if i may place my person one over here there is a likelihood for the for the uh, logical senses that sound might be traveling from here reflecting off the wall passing through the door and reach over here so this wall could be considered to be reflection surface for a path like this that's why i cons i replaced my person one position i didn't place him over here because so that my reflection could not be a significant option for my experimental process so i'm placing my sound source over here and placing the observation point maybe a microphone maybe a second person over here so that there is a physical barrier so the sound cannot travel in a straight line and because the person can a, a is able to hear the sound we can say the sound is definitely undergoing some diffraction so these are uh, the other properties of the sound waves so the next thing that this uh, video that we have seen also did not cover was the part of echo so i'm gonna take up that part of echo uh, right after a small break i'm gonna be up in five minutes if you have any question that you would like to ask me, just prepare them so that you can shoot me those questions immediately. I'll, I'll be right back. Five minutes. So, uh, Shabdoshi asked me a question that is it possible to just hear the sound determine whether it has gone through reflection, reflection, or diffraction without an oscilloscope? Um, if we just I mean, our, uh, if we use an observer, I mean, to be able to detect that a sound has reached a certain observation point, you need to use a certain observing mechanism. That observing mechanism can be a person or that observing mechanism can be a microphone which is attached to an oscilloscope. So person or, or oscill microphone oscilloscope works as your detector of the sound to reach a certain physical location how does that sound reach to that location is actually defined by what kind of experimental setup do you have around that place so just hearing a sound wouldn't define what is the process by which you receive that sound you have to consider what are the uh, physical factors enabled within that location uh, to for you to hear that sound for example there are certain charges uh, which were designed uh, in much earlier, which make a really beautiful, long, echoing sound. Uh, let me show you one of those uh, uh, videos. Uh, Uh, 
So, I cannot see the sound. Maybe I should really go in YouTube and look out for that. Just a second. No, I don't know. Okay, yes. Here to this music. This person. So do you understand what I mean? The sound takes time to die out. So obviously inside this room, uh, the idea of for uh, 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 diffraction is not applicable because we are hearing the same sound as it is produced in the same same source of the location. So we are not observing the sound in a different place. And also the reflection is not applicable because the entire temperature of the sound within the charge might be as well same. So the reason we are having the longing of the sound, I mean it is time for the sound to die out because it is getting reflected off the inner boundary of the churches. It's designed in such a way that the sound would be lasting. That's what gives this beautiful reverb effect within this uh, charge. Until the Son of God appears. Does it answer your question? Yes, sir. Good. So it's, it's all uh, so you have to judge that what physical uh, mechanism is at play for us to experience what we are experiencing that would define is it is the sound undergoing reflection or reflection or maybe a combination of multiple effects or whatnot so we have to observe the scenario involved and that's important so the idea for echo is pretty simple <laughs> echo it can be used in a lot of different ways uh, the key idea for echo is that whenever we hear a sound whenever we make a sound and hear its reflection that's what we call an echo so the, basically the reflection of a sound is called an echo this is just a name for the reflection of a sound one thing is very important for the consideration of echo is what we call the uh, uh, i actually forgot the actual phrase uh, let me just find out what is it called in terms of uh, physics duration of time sound stays in human brain is called what okay it's called echoic memory uh, i forgot this phrase so whenever we hear a sound typically the sound can last within our brain for two to four seconds but our audible equipment, biological audible equipment, the ear, I mean, the, all the ear, it can differentiate different sounds when the gap between multiple sounds is at least 0 0.1 second. Now, let me elaborate what this means. Let me elaborate what this means. Let's say you have a device that looks like this. Let me just show you. Uh, Worksheet. Five zero five four. No. No. Not this one. Worksheet. No. Thinking gas. Austin. Waves. You oh, want. Yeah, 
this one. This is actually one of the ways by which we, uh, the siren was made in the earlier ways. The way this machine works is this is actually a cogwheel, which is which can be made from wood, which can be made from metal. And there is a thin card, which is usually made from metal or can be also made from some other flexible material, which is strongly clamped with a support. And the end of this metal part is put in this cogwheel. This a cogwheel is basically like a gear which has teeth around. And this uh, cogwheel can be rotated by hand or by some uh, falling mass uh, gear mechanism or whatsoever. It's gonna, it can be rotated. Now, the idea is that every single time one of the teeth would be passing through the end of the, uh, end of the uh, card, the card is going to be pushed down. And when the card would be freed from the teeth, it would move really fast above and hit the upper card. So if you keep on rotating, if, if you start rotating this thing uh, slowly, this card is going to start to experience a continuous up and down motion. Can you visualize that? Like if, yes, sir. if we rotate the disc, this uh, flexible thin card is going to start to move up and down. And that up and down motion is going to produce vibration around the air and that can be heard by some other people. Now, here's the deal. If we rotate this wheel at a speed so that the number of teeth that this card experiences every second is less than 10. Let's say if this card experiences six, six teeth per second, maybe six teeth per second, six teeth per second, per second. What's going to happen? We are going to be able to observe all of these individual click sound individually. So you're going to hear click, 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 click like that. So we're going to hear six clicks every second. And we're going to be able to say that these sounds are produced by uh, small sounds. So these are what you call pulse sounds, which are individually detectable. And the reason we can detect them individually is because all of those sounds would have a gap of more than 0.1 second. You need to understand if we want to make sound, individual sounds or individual, uh, individual click sound through that device, which would have a gap less than 10 at uh, 0.1 second, then we need to make it more than 10 teeth per second. So when the wheel will be rotated at a much faster rate, maybe let's say if we rotate the wheel at, uh, at maybe uh, 20 teeth per second or maybe 100 teeth per second, each of the teeth movement is going to, uh, is, is going to cause one up and down motion of the uh, clamped plate, and that's going to give us one vibration. So our ear actually can detect different sounds whenever the gap between consecutive crest and con consecutive waves or consecutive wavelengths or consecutive crest and trough is less than one second, which means if you hear one sound, let's say, I'm, uh, let's say if you hear one sound and hear the same sound, within a gap less than 0 0.1 second. And if I make it a continuous sound, for example, let's say, uh, for example, uh, let's say, uh, how can I put this? Uh, no, uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, I cannot think of a physical object that can be used for uh, comb uh, combine, uh, combine, uh, that can combine both of these things. <clears throat> okay, uh, I'll try to make sense with it. I have in my hand a spoon and I have a glass top on my table. If I make one vibration with the spoon on the glass, this is how it sounds like. Okay, that's one pulse of a sound. Now, if I drag the spoon within the rough part of the glass border edge, this is how it sounds. You are hearing a continuous sound because within the small ups and downs of the rough part that was rubbed down so that the sharp is not there. Uh, the reason we are hearing that kind of a sound is because the sound, the spoon was moving up and down so fast that each individual sounds were reaching our ear at a gap less than 0 0.1, so which means we are hearing more than 10 individual vibrations every second. That way we perceived it as a continuous sound. This is very important for you to understand because if we make a sound and if you want to hear the echo different than the original sound, the echo should reach our ear taking a time longer than 0 0.1 second. 
if the original sound and the echo both reach our ear within a time of 0 0.1 second then we would not be able to detect that echo was there we will receive our ear will receive that echo is the echo gonna be there yes will our ear, ear be able to differentiate it from the original sound that answer is no for example let's say you are sitting in a room in front of your beside you there is a wall maybe one of the wall is perfectly blank if you talk towards that wall you should understand that the sound should travel towards the wall and eventually reach back to you but can you hear any echo the answer is typically for a regular uh, room within uh, within the within Hakao Chitang city or any any other cities uh, we cannot hear the echo because the time it takes for the sound that you produce out of your mouth to reach from your lips to your ear by means of diffraction which is the direct path and the time it takes for the sound to travel from your mouth get off the reflection of the wall and eventually reach back to your ear that the the gap between these two sound pulses to reach in your ear is less than 0 0.1 second that's why you cannot say the individual sounds different from each other which was not the case for the singer that i showed you a bit earlier because this chart was designed in such a way that sound would take individually different reflection path and different reflections are going to reach back to the uh, uh, to the singer or to the listener following different individual different paths so there would be significantly different path lengths for individual reflections as a result different sounds would be heard differently so it would take longer for the sound to die out or we would be hearing the sound for a much longer duration than from a regular room so point that i'm trying to make is our ear can distinguish between two sounds if the two sounds are at least 0 0.1 second apart more than 0 0.1 second, X second apart very good but less than 0 0.1 second apart our ear cannot differentiate that sound so if we want to hear an echo in this case by saying hear an echo i mean differentiate an echo from the original sound so that we can say that this was the original sound this was the echo these two sounds has to be at least 0 0.1 second apart which brings us to a bit of a mathematical calculation is that if we have a source of sound over here let's say there is a person over here who is making a sound uh let's say they are making a pulse kind of sound pulse kind of sound means uh not a continuous sound like ah uh, that's what you call mean a continuous sound let's say they are making a pulse kind of sound like maybe uh hitting the spoon with the glass that's one pulse of a sound so there's a sharp sound but and that's not continuous like like that i can actually make continuous sound with spoon and glass i i don't have the capability but do you understand what i'm saying so if this is a person who is who has uh, who is making a pulse kind of sound let's say usually what we prefer is to have two pieces of wooden blocks within their hand because wooden blocks whenever clapped together can dry wooden blocks can make a really loud sound and let's say this person is making this sound and in front of this person there is a wall the idea is that the person is going to make this sound and the sound should travel towards this wall and reflect off this wall and eventually be it should reach to the person once again so if the person want to hear the sound these sounds echo what should be the minimum gap between the person and the wall let's say what should be the minimum distance between them if you wonder why am i getting to the term minimum because the further the gap the bigger the gap the longer the sound would take so sound taking longer than 0 0.1 second would be definitely detectable if the wall gets closer or the person and the gap between the person and the wall i mean wall gets closer doesn't mean the wall is walking i am meaning that the person is walking towards the wall so the distance in between them is uh, uh, is getting smaller. If that happens, there is a certain minimum distance beyond which the person wouldn't be able to hear their echo different from the original sound. We're trying to find out that. So whenever an echo would be heard, the sound should travel from the source, go towards the wall and eventually reflect back, which means this distance D has to be traveled twice. So I can write the equation for this uh, speed as 2D by T. For the case of echo, this is the important equation. There is it. There should be a two for the in-between distance, and that brings us the equation d equals to vt by two. So typically, normally, in at room temperature, at a regular humidity, the speed of sound is about 350 meter per second. This is a number that I know. It's better if you can remember this thing. If you can't remember this thing, no big deal. Usually, this number is provided in the question. The usual sound speed in uh, regular air in room temperature and pressure is about 350 meter per second if you wonder why am i using the word about because the room temperature can vary from different place to place uh, depending upon the season and geographic location the humidity also can vary from different place to place so using the word about actually gives you a little bit of leeway 
so the information is not entirely incorrect if you say it is exactly 350 meter per second uh, might as well be a little bit of stringent in terms of uh, number so this is the amount of speed typical uh, sound speed through atmosphere and the minimum time that we want to uh, have is 0 0.1 second so let's try that if the sound has to take exactly 0 0.1 second to cover this entire distance back and forth divided by two this gives you about 17.5 meter which means if the person is standing at least 17.5 meter away from the reflection wall the person would be just able just able to declare that the person can detect the echo if the distance is more than that the sound is going to take more than 0 0.1 second because that way the sound has to travel a longer distance and the taken time would be bigger that way the echo would be even better better audible so that's the idea for the echo equation the key part that you should take in from here is that this is the equation for speed calculation for echo cases whereas if we if we did if we, if we do an experiment where the sound should travel in only a single straight line the equation we use is only v equals to d over t this is for a single path and this is for a return path that's the important bit and there are multiple different experiments that we use to uh, measure the speed of sound in air there are uh, three different ex experiments that uh, uh, that uh, that was earlier uh, including a syllabus later they discovered the third process which is a resonance tube resonance tube was discovered from a syllabus which is a very good thing because you kids do not have the concept of resonance up till your a levels a2 level to be more precise so the idea of resonance is not actually a good thing to teach you without any precursory idea uh, explanation uh, it's not a logical thing to do so now you have only two procedures how we can measure the speed of sound one of the experiment that some look something like this the other one is about the gunshot method that a person should be shooting a gun i'll be showing that experimental process hopefully in the next class and also what we're going to cover in our next class is the three properties of sound which is speech loudness and quality of a sound and that would pretty much be for the sound chapter and then i can show you some mathematical problem and there are some question regarding the graph drawing for specific, especially for the echo procedure i'm going to picking up some of these problems in our next class uh, and we'll pick it up from there it's 11 pm i hope you are hungry because i'm hungry so i'll call it today any questions yeah. um, 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 we, uh, booklet are ready for booklet ready for Yes. Do you have a question? Do you have a question? Yes. Do you have a question? Yes. Okay. 